Hi, this is Jay Gill. This session has two different topics related to Infinera technology leadership, optical leadership and open leadership. Let's start with optical leadership. First, let's put optical leadership in perspective. What does it actually do for Infinera customers? We want to help our customers win in their markets, and we do that by delivering networks to them that have a lower total cost of ownership than competitive networks, maximize their fiber capacity and therefore their investments in fiber, and accelerate their time to revenue and speed to service. So we use many different techniques to do that. One of them is optical performance, delivered with photonic integration, advanced coherent technologies, implemented primarily in digital signal processing, and these things help to drive down the cost and power per bit and increase the capacity reach. So those are really focused on capacity and TCO. Some of the other elements of the Infinera uh, solutions and experience, uh, including cloud scale network features and technologies, and the Infinera experience, uh, including our services, are focused on uh, both total cost of ownership and time to revenue. So those are important too. Uh, we're going to focus on optical leadership and particularly optical performance uh, for the rest of this presentation, but this just puts it in context. Now optical leadership is a key part of enabling our vision and we deliver optical leadership through vertical integration. So the infinite vision to remember is to enable an infinite pool of intelligent bandwidth that the next communication infrastructure is built upon. And we've been pursuing this since the founding of the company. The strategy to get there is built on vertical integration. And when we say vertical integration, we specifically mean photonic integration, DSP and electronics innovation, and module and system integration. Photonic integration is one of the things that Infinera is known best for. And that's basically the process of producing photonic integrated circuits that incorporate all the functions normally found in many, many discrete optics devices, thereby re reducing the cost and complexity of an optical engine. When we produce our uh, vertically integrated optical engines, we refer to them as the infinite capacity engine family. We've had photonic integrated circuits for several generations and digital signal processors as well. Uh, as of the most recent generation, which is shipping today, which is the f based on the fourth generation pick and our latest DSP, we call that ICE-4. So uh, ICE-4 was really the first one where we used the term ICE, and now we're leading towards the future with uh, generations that will be known as ICE-5, ICE-6, and so forth. One of the benefits of op uh, optical integration that Infinera optical engines deliver is our uh, implementation of super channels. And a super channel is multiple wavelengths all delivered from a single device and that they can be treated as a unit for provisioning and management, and that makes turn up and management of networks simpler. It also can allow for tighter channel spacing, which we'll get into. Um, basically, with a super channel, you get a more efficient overall architecture. Another key element of our differentiation in optical leadership is a set of capabilities that we put under the uh, header of Advanced Coherent Toolkit. And you can see many of them listed on the slide here. All of these are important in delivering high optical performance, and some of them are unique to Infinera. We're going to focus specifically on Nyquist subcarriers and on flexible and tight channel spacing. But all of these are, are really important uh, characteristics and, and in many cases advantages for Infinera. Nyquist subcarriers are really important in many different respects, and uh, it's worth understanding the technology just a little bit. While a carrier is produced by one laser, subcarriers are actually digitally created from that single laser, and they can be uh, basically multiples or, or, or subcarriers within that, that spacing that um, might be two or four or more subcarriers all generated digitally. And subcarriers are important because they are actually at a fraction of the speed or the baud rate of the uh, primary carrier, and that increases their tolerance to nonlinearities. And as you get into 
long haul networks and particularly subsea networks that becomes very important for increasing the capacity reach. So what you see with the charts on the right uh, is a, sub, a set of carriers in a super channel, and one of those carriers is blown out to show four subcarriers. That's uh, indicative of the number of subcarriers that we have in the ICE-4 engine uh, for each carrier. Uh, when you look at that super channel, then with all the subcarriers, you can see it divides up into much uh, smaller uh, chunks of spectral width. Uh, farther to the right, you see that there's a characteristic of nonlinear tolerance or ability to handle nonlinear penalties in transmission that subcarriers improves. So as baud rate goes up, the tolerance to nonlinearities goes down. Uh, subcarriers allow you to operate at a lower baud rate where the tolerance is higher. And that means when you translate to the bottom right that the Q value or the uh, quality of the signal, which also correlates to the optical signal to noise ratio, is higher with subcarriers than with a single carrier. So that allows us to launch with higher power to go longer distances with the, for equivalent capacity. Ice force tight channel spacing is also becoming really important in achieving uh, differentiated performance in the field. In a conventional set of wavelengths, you have a guard band between each of the wavelengths. That's shown on the top. On the bottom, you see ICE-4 wavelengths. They're shaped uh, spectrally more sort of rectangularly, so that's what's indicated there. Right now on the chart, they're shown as being spaced equal to a conventional system. Uh, what you see in a conventional system is that there's a roll-off in the uh, from the peak power of the uh, center part of a wave to the edge, and that can typically be 10 to 20 percent. Infant air subcarriers roll off much more quickly, maybe a 2 to 6 percent roll off factor, which means that um, they're contained within a very uh, tight space. And then there's a factor called wave locking, where uh, these waves, uh, wavelengths have to be controlled for frequency, and uh, if you have individual lasers with a, an independent wave locker, they will vary a little bit. Their, their independent frequencies will shift with time, just a natural function of the device. Uh, and so you have to watch out for um, waves that are shifting in different directions, independent frequency shifts, which may cause waves to, uh, to collide with each other. And that's why you have to have substantial guard band in between wavelengths. Uh, with the photonic integrated circuits that we have, where multiple waves are produced from a single uh, device, a single pick, a shared wave locker allows them to have correlated frequency shifts. So they'll all be shifting in the same direction. And what that means is that you don't have to have nearly as much of a guard band between the waves. You can pack them more tightly together and uh, still know that you're going to avoid any kind of performance penalty due to overlapping wavelengths. So that gets us to tighter channels. What does that actually mean in practice? It, re it means that we've been able to achieve some records in the field and in, in, in actual devices that we're delivering. Uh, one such record is our record for 16 quam fiber capacity. With the tighter channel spacing, we're able to get 27.6 terabits online, where most other implementations are a little bit lower, around 25 uh, terabits. And that's the highest in the industry. And it's enabled in part by those Nyquist subcarriers as shown uh, within the little wave form to the right. As we look to increase fiber capacity further by using the L-band, we can duplicate this performance of tight channel spacing and, and double the capacity up to over 50 terabits. So um, that uh, is, is a characteristic that will translate from a C-band to the L-band. At the other end of the um, distance scale, we have achieved record spectral efficiency on very long subsea links. In this case, uh, the link that we're highlighting is one operated by Seaborne. It goes from North to South America. We were able to show with commercially available ICE-4 equipment 50% more capacity than others. And this is based upon bringing the whole toolkit, the advanced coherent toolkit in ICE-4 into this uh, trial and, and you can see the various different uh, factors that we believe contributed to us getting this rec record spectral efficiency. And we continue to set new spectral efficiency records for subsea links even, uh, even now.
Another element of ICE 4's leading performance is uh, something that was built into the ICE 4 DSP for tolerating lightning strikes on aerial fibers. Uh, these are actually a big problem that a lot of operators are interested in solving and very interested in our solution for it because it's uh, the only uh, solution in the market, as far as we know, that offers 100% protection from the types of impacts that lightning can have. Um, and part of the reason that we can do this and others have had trouble or, or, or may not be able to do it is because of those Nyquist subcarriers. Again, it turns out it's easier to divide the problem by four and to solve it rather than to solve it as one monolithic problem. So as we look forward to future generations of ICE, um, we need to understand that we're going to be shifting more focus to uh, increasing the baud rate and getting uh, tighter and tighter integration between the elements of the optical engine. What this three-axis plot shows is that improving scale in uh, optical transmission can be done in multiple ways. Uh, on the vertical axis, you see the baud rate. That's the speed of transmission and uh, the different speeds that uh, we uh, have now and are looking forward to are shown there. We're currently at uh, 33 gigabaud delivery. Uh, upcoming systems will have 66 gigabaud and we're moving towards 100 gigabaud systems. On the left axis, you can see uh, we show both modulation and channel spacing, which both tend to increase fiber capacity. So as we've gone from uh, modulations like QPSK that have been in, in the field for a while to more advanced modulations, 8QAM, 16QAM, and now uh, in the near future, 64QAM, and not far behind that constellation shape, 64QAM, we're getting more and more capacity out of uh, every fiber by translating more uh, bits per symbol. The channel spacing, though, can have an equally or even bigger uh, impact on the uh, fiber capacity, as we just discussed. So that's another way to get uh, better fiber capacity. On the right or lower right axis, you see the um, axis is labeled multi-channel or super channel. And this is referring to our ability to get multiple carriers um, and subcarriers in a group and um, reduce the cost per uh, trans transport device or per optical engine. So as you look at the capacity per wavelength, that's a combination of baud and modulation. That's going from you know 200 gig commonly deployed today to 600 gig in the near future and 800 gig and beyond uh, as we look a little bit further out. If you look at the capacity of the devices, particularly the Infinera ICE devices, we've gone from early days of 100 gig devices to our current 1.2 terabit ICE 4 devices and 2.4 terabits for the next generation ICE 5, as we'll see. On the fiber capacity side of things, so it's important to understand that fiber capacity is nearing the Shannon limit. So there's diminishing returns from trying to improve modulation. The next step, which kind of gets us close to the edge, is constellation shaping, or sometimes referred to as probabilistic constellation shaping. And to really do that well, we're going to need to get to smaller uh, dimension silicon. So the next silicon node, as they call it, 7 nanometer silicon, will be where we can uh, put enough silicon to work doing the, uh, the probabilistic constellation shaping algorithms in order to get that last bit of capacity from uh, more advanced modulation. But tight channel spacing uh, continues to be a great tool as well. Uh, the advantages on the lower right are really more unique infinite advantages because of our photonic integration, our super channel design, and our subcarrier designs. And we believe we're going to have some unique capabilities uh, going forward with optical engine integration in terms of tightly integrating uh, photonic integrated circuits and DSPs with co-design and co-packaging, which we'll talk briefly about. So where does that lead us in terms of our next engines? We've announced ICE-5 uh, as a, the world's first integrated 2.4 terabit engine. And you can see some of the characteristics here. It includes a new DSP and new fifth generation photonic integrated circuits. Uh, in, in this case, the uh, PICs are divided between the transmit and receive in separate um, devices. And we're getting uh, to the same kind of benchmarks that many others are targeting, which is 64 QAM, 66 gigabaud operation, which allows us to get up to 600 gigabits per wave. 
uh, with flexible baud and hybrid modulation so that we have optimized capacity reach from short distance metro uh, reach to much, much longer reaches. Uh, we're continuing to maintain our compatibility with uh, the idea of open ice, which we'll talk about shortly, uh, ability to work over a third-party line system, uh, looking towards supporting client, client interfaces up to 400 gigabit Ethernet, and support for layer one encryption. The PIC itself has four wavelengths in this case, and uh, it's got uh, performance enhancements that allow it to run at these faster rates, 66 gigabit. Um, flexible reach, as before, we'll use the same devices with just varying uh, grades of performance for short haul to subsea applications. And we can produce uh, super channel outputs or single carrier outputs with this engine, which uh, fit varying customer requirements. Also important about the photonic integrated circuits is um, we get much higher reliability out of these uh, picks than we would see from the same amount of di discrete components to implement the same functionality. This has been proven over a uh, number of years of operations with picks. As we look a little farther out, I6 is going to again be a, a ne new generation of flex coherent digital signal processor and a an, uh, new uh, sixth generation PIC. Uh, importantly, though, both of these will be ev evolutions from the prior generations. On the DSP side, we're evolving our advanced coherent toolkit, and the modulations uh, are, that are being added are all related to this probabilistic constellation shaping. On the PIC side, we're basing the uh, technology on Gen 5 devices that are already in test and demonstrating high uh, baud rate and high speed. So we believe that we're well on our way to uh, delivering all the components to lead the push to 88 to 100 gigabaud operation uh, with superior integration uh, to get us to 800 gigabits per wavelength for short haul and metro DCI applications, as well as continuing to extend our industry leading performance in the long haul and subsea, particularly in terms of overall spectral efficiency for those applications. With I6, we've already made some progress in terms of demonstrating devices operating at uh, at or around 100 gigabaud. Uh, in 2017, we were able to publish a, a transmission uh, demonstration there. In 2018, we have subsequently added uh, transmit plus receive in a, in a full end-to-end -end, uh, link using uh, I6 prototype picks at 100 gigabaud. So we're well on our way to, to hitting these speed numbers that we need to. Now let me shift gears to open leadership. Um, open is another component of leadership that uh, Infineer has been emphasizing recently. So open can mean many things, and it's important for us to be open uh, in different ways. Uh, on the top half of the chart here, you see several instances that have to do more with software openness, uh, both the software systems that we provide on the uh, open interfaces and application uh, um, applications that we support. So uh, at the top, uh, our Exceed SDN platform is based on open daylight and uh, provides uh, industry st uh, standard open APIs that can be used for integration in a variety of different environments, including northbound with orchestrators that may come from many different uh, suppliers. Uh, and we've got on our SDN platform and our software, as well as in our network elements, uh, the native devices to the network elements, support for a wide range of open APIs, uh, including NetConfyang, REST, XML, OpenFlow, OpenConfig, uh, gRPC for telemetry, and later for other applications as well. Uh, so there's a whole variety of ways in which, uh, from a software perspective, we're supporting open integration. On the bottom half are several uh, highlights about our open leadership that have more to do with open optical networks themselves. And so, uh, first of all, Flex ILS uh, is our flagship line system, and we believe the industry's most widely deployed flexible grid open line system. Open ICE is our uh, set of solution capabilities to run our ICE-based products uh, over any line system, and we have a lot of success 
working over uh, many vendors line systems as shown on the chart. And related to those is our membership in and leadership of uh, the Telecom Infra Project, which has a, a, an open optical packet project and uh, within that an open line system working group, which we've been co-leading since its founding. And we're also a member of the Open Rotom MSA and collaborating with other groups that are working on similar things, such as the uh, Open Networking Foundation and, and the OIF. So uh, across all these things, we feel like we are doing the right things to be open, which our customers are asking for. We'll focus a little bit more on the bottom half of the chart and the open themselves. Now we see a, a general direction for disaggregation that um, many operators are interested in. Some are pursuing more aggressively than others. And the ultimate vision there would be mixing and matching uh, all sorts of different components, transponders, uh, line system components, amplifiers, rotums, controllers, uh, orchestrators uh, from any vendor and having it all work together. So mixing and matching, not just between two vendors, but between many, uh, all the way down to individual line system components, transponders and terminals. Of course, this requires open standard APIs for control and management and a, a robust approach for SDN-based control, so disaggregating control from any individual vendor products, uh, and uh, ultimately being able to manage with a, uh, an automated management and orchestration um, uh, approach, including uh, what people refer to as uh, MANO. Uh, finally, in order to make all this stuff work, there, there need to be people who understand how to integrate and in many operators, that will mean a, a do-it-yourself set of talent to uh, bring multiple vendors together into a, a, a smoothly operating system. Now, the reality is we're not going to be at this fully disaggregated vision right away. And so um, what we really need to look at is what's going to happen in the near term. And in the near term, the thing that is very much a reality is concept of an open line system. In this case, the line system is shown all in green, so it's provided by one vendor, including the line system controller, but it's compatible with transponders from multiple vendors shown in different colors. And this is uh, basically where we're actually uh, doing deployments today. So with the single vendor line system controls, you have one domain of operation, and then the transponders are another domain, and, and they can be made to work together with um, you know independent management and over time moving to um, you know more integrated SDN based control. Um, the key thing with the um, transponders is that uh, they are um, you know not just the current transponders and terminals that are available today, but a, a good future proof line system really needs to be anticipating what are the transponders that are coming tomorrow. And that's part of the reason why it needs to be flexible flexible grid, needs to be able to handle higher uh, baud rate uh, and higher modulation transponders as they are coming and, um, and be uh, more flexible in terms of how it can be uh, managed to uh, handle all of those together. So we believe FlexILS, as mentioned, is uh, the industry's leading open line system. It was designed to be open from day one and effectively we've got uh, uh, the ability to support our Infinera super channels and single carrier transponders from other vendors. And as we see the future-proof open line system requirements, we believe it's the uh, leading system in the industry for meeting all those requirements. Uh, we have equal support for alien waves and Infinera waves, all the way from provisioning to operating, power balancing, and troubleshooting. Um, we're the only line system today that support super channels um, directly. Some others are coming in that direction, but uh, we, we can use single carriers or multiple carriers. Um, and we believe we've got all the support for future uh, trans, uh, transponders and optical engines that will be coming from us and from others for the next decade or more. And therefore, we can legitimately call the system future proof. We look at some of the requirements that make it future-proof uh, going down the left, uh, automated power control, uh, flexible uh, flex grid operation, including cha variable channel width and spacing and signal rates and so forth. 
Um, and, and Flex ILS is checking all the boxes on these things, whereas some of our primary competitors are still operating in fixed grid or, or don't have the ability to handle um, a lot of the different formats for transponders and, uh, and multi-carrier uh, sources. Shifting gears to open ice, this is where our ice-based products are deployed over uh, a third-party line system. And we, we talk about this being bringing the Infinera experience to your existing network. Uh, so you can see on the bottom it says open line system fixed or flex grid, which is a key component of our uh, being compatible with line systems that are why would people want to use our transponders over their existing line systems? Uh, it can boil down in many cases to uh, getting out of a vendor lock-in and being able to be more nimble and uh, be more competitive as an operator. So in some t cases, uh, the need to deploy more capacity on short notice uh, may be hard to, to handle. And so uh, by using our uh, open ice, we can turn time into competitive advantage for them. And this depends in part on being able to use things like instant bandwidth, where you can pre-deploy some open ice transponders on your existing network, turn up capacity with instant bandwidth licenses on demand. Um, sometimes existing line systems and, uh, and, and systems from uh, older vendors are actually getting to be non-competitive in terms of cost and lead times as well. Putting new transponders in uh, is actually more costly than adding a, a, a alien transponder, an open ice transponder uh, from Infinera uh, to maximize the use of the existing capacity on that system. Um, and then a key thing at the bottom is limited investment budget. While some operators would love to make a wholesale transformation of their network to the latest technology, uh, in many cases they need to sweat their investments and continue to to maximize the capacity they get out of the current network um, and not justify a full network upgrade all at once. And that's fine from our perspective because we can become the uh, vendor who um, supplies the incremental capacity over the existing line system and then ultimately over time we hope to convert the whole system toward uh, an Infinera system. We look at um, some of the reasons why people would want to use Open Ice. One important uh, set of reasons is because we've got some superior performance. This comes back to the optical performance part of the presentation earlier uh, in this same session. Uh, so people are attracted to that ICE4 performance. They like the idea of some of the cloud scale features and agility that we can offer them with sliceable super channels and instant bandwidth, which you'll hear about in a different session. They like the Infinera uh, experience in terms of how we deliver and support our customers. And they want to be able to get that without having to change out their entire network. And so that allows, the Open ICE allows them to bring uh, all those benefits to their existing network. And as shown on the left side here, they can even do that in a mixed network where they may have some Infinera line system and some other line system. And uh, they can use Open ICE to extend uh, network connectivity uh, directly at the optical layer all the way from one end of one network to the other network. Uh, we're showing here a case that's using XT3600s powered by ICE4 and this is representing an actual customer deployment where they have uh, two different line systems and they're, they're using end-to-end uh, -end XT3600 optical wavelengths in order to create uh, kind of an overlay virtual network for a major customer of theirs. Um, that is not only great from the point of view of standardizing the solution, which makes it very efficient and simple to kind of operate and provision new capacity and so forth, uh, but it also eliminates intermediate signal regeneration. Uh, in, in the places between these two networks, traditionally you would have to put back-to-back -back transponders for regeneration, and that's very costly, uh, also complex to provision. By eliminating that with open ice, we're actually re reducing cost complexity. And in some cases, it might even matter to some customers that we're reducing latency slightly as well. So the bottom line on deploying open ice in a situation like this is getting to lower TCO and increased agility. Just to highlight the point about how open ice allows us to work over existing fixed grid systems, we've demonstrated this over several uh, such systems in trials and labs and the field. You can see some of the logos at the bottom. 
And basically what we need to do in this case is just deliver individual channels into 50 gigahertz um, channel spacing, uh, fixed, traditional fixed grid channel spacing. So we can do that with our ICE engine. Um, Open ICE also works even more efficiently if you have a third-party flexible grid line system, which allows for uh, variable uh, capacity super channels to be routed across it. So in this diagram, you can see super channels or individual channels all the way from 100 gigabits up to 1.2 terabits. And uh, those are shown in the bottom um, grouped together in different numbers of wavelengths, uh, depending upon the capacity requirements for different uh, parts of the network. And so um, this is actually demonstrated over uh, some existing systems as, as well, including Lamentum and Sienna's. But mostly those uh, systems are still just in the lab and, and there aren't too many deployed. But as they get deployed, we'll have the ability to run open ice over them as well. Final thing to say about open ice is that it's not just about the product and about uh, getting wavelengths to, to actually run over somebody else's line system. There's a process involved in uh, understanding how to uh, plan and, and manage wavelengths over another system. And so we, we call that light and validate. Uh, sometimes we can get a lot of good information about the existing line system in order to plan properly. Uh, sometimes we can't, and uh, we actually go out and test the system and characterize it in order to do uh, a very clear uh, baselining and understanding what's possible and, and how we can deploy open ice over that system. And then, of course, we can provide installation services and uh, service assurance that are geared towards open ice situations where uh, we obviously need to be able to be aware of the third-party line system as part of the uh, operating environment and be able to troubleshoot and evaluate you know, performance and so forth on an ongoing basis. So those services are all set up and that can, completes the open ice uh, solution.